Hello and welcome to First Flight, a Star Trek Enterprise rewatch podcast where we are watching and discussing each episode of Enterprise in succession. First Flight is a proud member of the Tricorder Transmissions Network. This is Commander Tucker of Enterprise. We've got some information you're going to want to hear. Welcome, Enterprise fans. I am your co-host, Melanie. And I'm your co-host, Abby. Tonight, we are discussing the fourth episode of Season 1, Unexpected. This episode was written by Rick Berman and Brannon Braga and directed by Mike Vehar. It aired on October 17, 2001. We want to give a trigger content warning before we launch in, as we will be discussing topics such as pregnancy and consent issues. But before we begin our discussion, we need to issue a read alert. Tactical alert. All hands to stations. There are potential spoilers ahead. We might end up talking about any part of the series at any time. And now for a summary of the episode, it's time for Abby's Captain's Log. Okay, Abby, let's go. Captain Starlog Supplemental. All right, this is a hard one to distill down, but here's my <laughs> recap. After discovering an alien vessel using Enterprise's wake to help them get home, Trip visits the Zerillion ship to help them make repairs. He befriends an engineer there and surprisingly returns to Enterprise pregnant. It's time to deploy our subspace transmitters and get into this episode. Well, Abby, we've arrived at the first Enterprise episode that I think we could call controversial. People have many feelings about. For me, there are some parts that I really like and are cool and parts that I really don't care for so very much. So I'm curious to hear what your impressions are of Unexpected. <sighs> well... First of all, since we first started talking about doing this podcast, I have been saying, you know, this means I'm going to have to talk about Trip's nipples to the world. And here we are. I have to talk about Trip's nipples to the world. And I want to start by saying, I understand that this was written and produced 20 years ago, and we have come a long way as a society in general in our feelings, in our representation, into our acceptance of gender and sexuality and cultures that are different than our own. But that being said, as a mother of two young girls, this is a hard rewatch for me, at least the second half of it. And mm. I adore Trip. I, he's one of my favorite, if not my favorite character on Enterprise. I enjoy most of the male characters on Enterprise, but they took one of the most common sci-fi ideas of male pregnancy and just distilled it down to kind of the tropes and the men and writers and characters are who are seem to be so blissfully unaware of the nuances of actual pregnancy that they fell into the common pattern of harassing a friend because the way they are makes them feel uncomfortable. And while I fully stand behind that we cannot judge older media by today's standards, I really wish that somewhere coming up in all of this fabulous new golden age of Trek that we have, that there's going to be a modern Star Trek episode that deals with this as gracefully as they have with other issues around sexuality and gender and the other areas where we've kind of progressed in society. That's my soapbox. I'm just starting out right there. I hear what you're saying. I think there's definitely a lot of pregnancy stereotypes, quote unquote, in this mm -hmm. episode that are... I guess I'll call cringeworthy, um, and I know we'll get there. So, you know, I can understand how you're feeling. Yeah, it, it's just one of those things that it is hard with, a, with today's lens to look back. And this is not the only piece of Star Trek, the only piece of media, the only piece of history that you look back and you just go, I wish we'd done better. But I think in a way that points out that we are doing better now. Mm -hmm. And while it's not an episode that I really want to go back and revisit over and over, though I did watch it four times, I feel it's important that we can see that 
even in just two decades. I mean, this isn't going back to TOS where you're like, oh, it was the 60s. It was a totally different time. This was only 20 years ago. And while that's a long time, it's a short time in the grand scheme of things. So it's nice to see that nowadays this would not have been put out on the air the way that it was. And that's that's hopeful. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think there are some interesting concepts that could have been explored in a more serious manner. Um, there, there's some interesting thought provoking concepts in this episode, I think. And, but by taking the humorous approach, that was not a great step in, in my eyes. And, and that's where some of my d- discomfort comes from. But I have to say, given the material that he was given, that Connor Trenier, you know, I have to give him credit for getting through this and, you know, keeping Trip going. <laughs> I mean, that, that couldn't have been easy for him, but he he takes it seriously and, you know, does what he can with the material for, you know, Trip's character kind of shining through. And it's too bad that he's getting made fun of. I yeah. do have to give the guy credit for that. I, I agree. He did. He tried so hard and the actor did everything he could. But there are some he's inconsistently written this episode. Mm-hmm. Yes. I mean, he's kind of it's the flirty. Then he's overly emotional and then he's grumpy. And there's there's a couple times where knowing where he ends up throughout this series and the growth he takes and having talked about how, you know, the character is still in his 30s. He's got some growing to do. There were still times in this episode where I wanted to look at him and go, really, dude, come on. I will just say that, you know, the scenes that stereotypical behavior is being, you know, exhibited and he's being made fun of with T'Pol really digging into him there with, yeah. with her barbs and sick bay that were, you know, pretty strong. And then later in the captain's mess scene where, you know, Arch is trying to stifle his smiles and Tripp saying, you know, I didn't want to be a working mother and all of that, that those parts are challenging and and like you I probably wouldn't choose to rewatch this episode on a regular basis <laughs> but those those were a little tough to take I agree all right so we know that this is the first one that we kind of go <laughs> on but there are some cool parts yes. too so let me let me shift it back to the things that I really liked because the first half of this episode I think really has a good beginning and then it kind of does a 180 so I really liked the very beginning of this episode when we saw all of the main cast helping to solve the mystery of the malfunctions and being successful. I mean, this is early on in season one and we've seen, you know, there's been weapons issues, there's been engine issues, there's been problems. And a lot of times they don't always end the way we wanted to. Well, this one, they did. They all, they figured out the pieces of the puzzle. They had some little laughs with some of the malfunctions. I mean, this is the infamous floating sour scene. So, but uh, I think it was really neat to see everybody come together and find the Zerillion ship. That was a nice way to see that our crew is already starting to find their groove together. Oh, definitely. I agree. I actually really like the first 20, 25 minutes of this episode. I think there's some stuff that's really well done. Speaking of the shower scene, I think it's kind of cool to see the pre-sonic shower days that, you know, it's still a shower we can relate to in the future. And I just want to say, I'm really glad that Archer didn't like break his tailbone or something because Ooh, I think that every I know, time. that was a tough fall, but, yes. um, but that is a, a really neat cold open. I, I liked that. And I, and when you talk about the crew coming together to problem solve, once again, Archer is very clever. He's the one who thinks to ignite that charge. He, he yep. figures out that there might be a ship there hiding. And I, I give them all credit for that. That was really, really cool. And I think the part that I like best at the beginning here is the alien ship design and the Zerillians themselves is yes. so well done. And so different yep. than anything else that we've seen before or after. It really feels alien and they feel alien. You, you read my mind. I, I completely oh. agree. It, it really struck me that it's different. It's not your just stereotypical humanoid ship. You know what I mean? It is yes. truly different. And all those conduits and the claustrophobic space, all the lights and the noise, the way it was designed, I really felt nauseous along with Trip. I mean, yeah, that, that decompression mm-hmm. sequence. Whew. 
the decompression sequence was really well done. So yeah. I really think the episode has that part of it, you know, has a lot going for it. Cause I, I really appreciated that. And I think the actress who played Alain did a really good performance. I thought, do you know who that actress is? I do not. Julianne Christie. She previously appeared on star Trek as the Talaxian Drexa, who's Neelix's love interest at the end of Homestead. And she is fantastic. And that voice, yep. it's different than Drexa's, but it's enough that as soon as I pieced that together, I was like, wait a minute. Oh, yes, it is her. But yeah, she's fantastic. And the alien movements of her body really worked well with this. Like it was almost like she was somewhere between one of those eels that you see swimming through their mm -hmm, windows mm -hmm. and some sort of lizard and a person. It was a really good blend. And I think all of even the background actors of the Zerillians and the captain and everybody really kind of mimics that. And they had that kind of fluidness to their motion, which made them feel very alien as well. And it also made me think they probably use that fluidity to wiggle themselves into all those weird little places that they have <laughs> into on the right ship. right you know i'm glad that you told me that was her because the voice sounded familiar she looked familiar yep. i couldn't put my finger on it i guess i could have googled it but <laughs> now that you say it it makes perfect sense and it yep. is her voice it is her you know face and she she did a, a really fine job i thought yeah i agree and we can't leave the ship without talking about how their food grows all over and they have grass that helps them digest. I mean, that's really interesting. And I would love to see that again. And I also kind of wonder in the back of my head, all right, well, what if, you know, they, they aren't that hungry or if the ship keeps growing and they all go on an away mission, like, do they come back and it's, do they, do they have natural composting going on? Who mows the lawn? Like, do they eat the grass? Like, there's just... I would love to explore that world of the Zerillians more, especially since, you know, their warp drive is different. They have a terraphasic coil. Right. I, I kind of want to know more about this. Like, this is somebody's fanfic right here. Anyone who wants to write it, let me know. <laughs> I think they are really interesting. I mean, they're clearly pretty technologically advanced, especially with their yeah. holodeck technology. And I think, you know, it's too bad that we didn't meet up with them again. They are one of my favorite one-off aliens. For sure. Speaking of the holodeck, I wanted to discuss that yes. briefly. But before we delve into the holodeck, I just have to say that resequenced photons would be a great band name. <laughs> yes, it would. Okay, the holodeck. I'm a little bit unclear on some of this. I think there's some vagueness here. Clearly, there's flirting going on. She likes him. He, he likes her. There's this telepathic game where genetic material was transferred. I can't figure out if she knew that was a possibility or if it, I mean, she did say, our, I didn't know our species were compatible, but I'm just a little bit unclear on that. And, you know, whether there was, you know, consent issues here, it's, it's a little vague to me. Yeah, it is definitely vague. And I guess... I've always thought that she has enough integrity, at mm -hmm. least from what we've seen, that I don't think she thought there would become a child involved. Right. I do think she was hoping that the telepathic game would work, that they would have that intimate moment. And I do wish she had given him more of an idea what was coming, because I really think that sharing brains is just as intimate, if not more intimate, than you know having a physical sexual encounter. Yeah. But I, I don't think she would have let him go off had she known that was even a possibility because we know the gestation period isn't super long. Right. Like she would have at least wanted to be able to come back and see him in five, six weeks or whatever it was. So I, I yeah, it's, it's iffy. And it's interesting too that this was 20 years ago. And if you're thinking about this as a consent thing, it's a little bit backwards from how consent is normally portrayed in media so that's that's interesting too i wonder if, if some of that is because she's alien as well 
Yeah, I hear you. I agree. Uh, Lynn does come across as being above board and a kind and caring person. And I do agree that she probably did not know that a baby was possible. And, you know, I also have to realize that they are from very different cultures, very different species, different customs, different approaches. There's probably communication issues going on. And it's before the first contact guidelines period. This is the era before first contact discussions. So I get all that. And you know, I love Enterprise. But the part that I just cannot get past after thinking about this and rewatching it is... It reads to me that Alain would have to know that they are engaging in something more than just a telepathic mind game. It seems to me that she would kind of have to know that. And the fact that Tripp was not informed of that and that he was not aware of that he was engaging in an intimate act above and beyond telepathy feels to me inappropriate towards Trip. I don't know really how else to put it. That doesn't sit well with me. And, you know, what I was thinking was if it was a woman crew member who returned from an away mission, surprisingly pregnant, who had no knowledge or memory of an encounter that would lead to that, that would be dealt with very, very differently. And it would not be I think, made as humorous as this one was. I think it would have been approached differently. And to me, that's not fair to Tripp. Um, It seems to me that Tripp has been through, you know, this is probably traumatic. This is a big deal for him. And and it's he's not getting one shred of support (laughs) from his crew members. He's, you know, being made fun of. So that's the part that I just can't get past. And that's why I was saying, I wonder what she did know and didn't know. It's just confusing and vague to me. And I could be wrong, but mm, that's my little soapbox. Yeah. Then Trip returns to the ship. Yeah, here comes our 180. The other part of the episode jumps off here. Interesting. What are your thoughts on Phlox and T'Pol and the sick bay and the situation? Here comes my heaving sigh. Okay. Like there's, there's so many layers to this. Now, let me start with, I, I really appreciate that Malcolm sees that Trip has this funny little bump and goes, well, you know, go get it checked out. Like they haven't been to a ton of alien planets. Yeah. He cleared decon, but you know, just go do it. That's, that's a good friend thing to do. I mean, and Trip seems like the kind of guy that might've ignored it for a couple more days and just been like, yeah, maybe it'll go away. I like laid on their grass funny or something. Mm-hmm. So Props to Malcolm. That was the right thing to do. I kind of expected Flox to have a reaction like that. Like, it's not so weird for him. It's not so unusual. I appreciate he was diplomatically trying to say, well, you know, there had to be some lengthy contact here if there was going to be this much genetic exchange. And he seems like he's the only one who believes that this might have been accidental immediately. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. And I think that's very flux. To Paul, I kind of did expect her to be all the way on the other side of the spectrum because she kind of always is. But it is disappointing knowing where she's going to get as a character and where she's going to get in her relationship with Trump. In fact, it's kind of interesting because she actually brings up this dalliance in Oasis, the episode further down the road. And Mm -hmm. Trip, you know, snaps back at her. Oh, you're never going to let that go. So there's already seeds of things there. And when you think about it coming from the very beginnings of possible jealousy, that maybe makes it read a little differently. But it disappoints me that they they made Archer, who probably has the deepest and most intimate friendship with Trip, be the one who doesn't necessarily believe that he couldn't be a gentleman. I mean, he said that before he even left, you know, mind your manners. Mm-hmm. Really? Would you have to say that's what, especially to Trip, who is nothing but positive and open and congenial and all the time to people. I mean, to Malcolm, maybe. <laughs> right. Boy, is she harsh with her barbs. <laughs> yeah. There's some zingers in there. Yeah. 
I think from but that's one of the reasons I love her. Like she can just shove out some of those and and it's so natural to her to have that kind of cynicalness that's caged in line. Oh, don't get me wrong. I, I love to Paul <laughs> and I love her zingers actually. I love to Paul yeah. and her zingers 99.9% of the time. I think in this situation it was just like so cringeworthy up to start with. It was kind of like, ah, but I adore to Paul. I think for me, what this episode could have benefited from. And if someone had taken Trip aside, like one of his close buddies, like Archer or Malcolm, yeah. and had a scene where someone said, oh my God, I can't believe this happened. And how are you feeling? And this is so shocking. And oh my gosh, I can't believe you're going through this. How can I support you? Maybe that would have bounced it a little more t- for me, but it just seemed that from halfway on, it became just, you know, pregnancy jokes. Yeah. And I... I thought about that a little bit too. And I sit here and I wonder, okay, so if this was made today, that would happen. But I wonder, and I I don't know enough about the drafts of this. If there wasn't something like that in there, that maybe they were like, they didn't want to add that layer to it because it made it more real as opposed to Mm. a humorous situation. And I think maybe they got away with it back then on air by making it more humorous and not going into all of that. And Mm -hmm. I am by no means assuming anything about any of the people who wrote or directed or did the teleplay or any of this, but it is when you look at the teleplay, the story and the direction, you've got four out of five men. And I don't know Phyllis Strong who helped with the teleplay. I don't know if she has children or not, but I, I did not understand pregnancy the way I do until I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's a lot of talk these days about, you know, writing what you know and getting, or at least getting feedback from somebody who's lived. And I wonder, did they talk to any women who've become pregnant, especially unexpectedly pregnant? Like, let's look at that. Let's talk to some people. Let's add that into our narrative. And that would have been perfect character development for him and anybody. I mean, it could have even been Hoshi coming in at one point. Yeah, yeah. Having that that different perspective, I think, or Flax, it could have been Flax. He would have been the perfect person to to talk to about this. And he could have said, well, you know, this species and that species and in my experience, and it could have been a really good deepening of that as well. Right. That's a good point. It Flax would have been perfect. You know, then we shift into this Klingon scene that I would like to discuss, which I really enjoyed with the exception of discussing Tripp's personal life on the bridge in front of everybody. And did you see the faces on Malcolm and Hoshi and Travis when he lifted up his shirt? Like, I don't know what direction they were given, <laughs> but oh man, those those were some very conflicted facial expressions. Definitely. Especially Malcolm. Yeah, I, I think I was focused on Travis, but I'm going to watch that again. I didn't care for the discussing Tripp's business on the bridge part. No, And I know that the Klingons might not be as receptive to, hey, can you beam over so we can have a private chat in a conference room? I get that. But if we take that part out of it, the rest of the scene, I really enjoyed because I love seeing Klingons and early Klingons. And there's yeah, the look into their battle, their bridge through the view screen was Perfect. That's a classic cruiser, right? There. Definitely. I mean, I loved seeing the classic Klingon cruiser there and when T'Pol announced what it was and they showed it on the screen. That was cool. And yeah. I really liked the conversation that Archer had with the Klingons. I really liked how T'Pol stepped in and was diplomatic and used her knowledge and her experience to turn the situation around with saying that they were just at Kronos and, you know, Archer's a brother and all of that. Yep. And I think that's such a huge asset to the ship. I mean, that's one of the biggest assets that, well, she has so many, but it's a big asset that to Paul provides is she has the experience. She has diplomatic experience. Also in the other episode, she tries diplomatic approaches with other species. Yep. So I really liked how she stepped in there and said, you know, what she said to, t- to turn the situation around. I thought that was really cool. I, yeah, I think the same lines. And I really enjoyed how at the end, that last scene in the captain's mess, I wish they had just cut it right when they were asking, well, you know, is this true? And she goes, well, 
you know, Klingons have been known to exaggerate. Mm-hmm. And that was perfect because that was a nice connection. And it's, again, we, we've talked a lot about how the crew is just trying to feel her out and create relationships and figure out if they can trust her. And this was a big step forward in that. And we will see that come up and, and be something that needs to continue to develop in the next few episodes. So it's nice that even though this wasn't an episode focused on her, we still had a step in that progression. I, I completely agree. And that was great. One more thing that I wanted to bring up before we are done with this is I know that this is an episodic show for the most part. And that later on down the line, we get into season long arcs and smaller you know, duologies and trilogies. But right now it's episodic. So they weren't going to ever give Trip a kid that he had to take care of, pay attention, have responsibilities for. So how incredibly convenient that it was only the genetics of the mother (laughs) that were part of this child. So Trip can just, you know, get it out of him and go on his merry way. And I think that that has a lot of interesting parallels and interesting statements about what our society was and what our society still is in relation to pregnancies that are both wanted and unwanted and parental responsibilities. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Pregnancy is not a disability. And I, I hate that that is how it got played in this show because it could have been, it could have been a goldmine. And maybe this is just an area that Trek will explore in the future and we'll go look at how much society has grown. Look at how much Trek has grown. My fingers are crossed. I mean, there's got to be a pregnant Starfleet officer going on somewhere besides Samantha Wildman, right? So we got a lot of opportunities. Here. Well, we have Belana Torres. That's true. That's true. And I thought that was played pretty well. That was played pretty well too. But uh, yeah, I would like to, I would like to see some, uh, maybe some, alternative looks into pregnancy like like we do later on when we have cogenitor i mean mm-hmm. that was almost like an apology for this episode mm, interesting <laughs> and now it's time for porthos's pick which is our favorite part of the episode abby what's your favorite part of unexpected all right so i have to say that my favorite part of this is a uh, Silly little throwaway line, but it is kind of a personal fantasy of mine for somebody to order me to take a nap. <laughs> so when Archer orders Trip to take a nap, I'm just like, wow, I wish that that was my life and somebody would do that to me because my answer would be, okay, thanks. I totally will. Can I have two hours? Oh, that's great, Abby. And I love that line take a nap. That's an order. Yep. And actually, I like that scene because, you know, Tripp's really struggling, right? And Archer yes. wants to protect his guy. You can tell how caring Archer is about Tripp because when, when yes. Tripp says, I can't make it, Archer immediately snaps into, okay, I need to talk to the captain and get this figured out. He's ready to take him back. But then, you know, Traval explains to Archer that actually Tripp didn't take the rest he was supposed to so that's when archer slides back into the mode of hey you need to try that first but i did like that scene where archer's kind of feeling out the situation and realizing should he have trip tough it out should he have him come back and and you can see that moment where as a friend and a captain he's like you know what my guy's not doing so good and i liked that you know caring side of archer of course i yeah i completely agree and i wish that that was the tone of their relationship that they had kept through the second half of the episode, because that shows how well they know each other, how much they care about each other, about how they'll turn to each other when they're feeling distressed. And he believed him when he said, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I mean, it was instant. Like you said, he believed him and he was going to do something about it. I still love that. He ordered him to take a nap. I still wish someone would come and do that for me every afternoon. Not going to (laughs) lie. I love that. I absolutely love that. And naps are good. Naps are heaven. (laughs) All right. What about you? What's your Porthos's pick this week? I think my favorite part remains the Klingon sequence with the exception of the trip showing, you know, the pregnancy on the bridge and talking about trips business. Um, If we take that out of it, like I said before, I do love to see the Klingons of this era 
The Klingon battle cruiser was great. To Paul stepping up and using, you know, tactics that she knew would work with the Klingons was absolutely brilliant. And I liked at the end when the Klingons said to Archer, you know, if you encounter us again, you're really going to regret it. Like, I just, yeah. I thought that was all played really well. And Archer has ongoing Klingon issues throughout the rest of the series. <laughs> he has Duras trailing him. You know, we've got, we have other Klingon encounters in the future. And this is, I believe, the first one of, of an adversarial situation, correct? Yes, this is the first time that there's, uh, at least the first time we know of, that there's that hostile encounter between Starfleet and the Klingons. I mean, they took Klang back and that wasn't hostile. That was thankful. So I think that that was probably, that would be my Porthos's pick is that that ending part was pretty cool. Yeah, it was neat. And I, I think it's neat how we can see the Zerillians having those first kernels of the holodeck and giving them to the Klingons and I really want to know what do the Klingons do with them before so many other people have this technology? I mean, is it just battle royale all the time or are they having, you know, there's, there's endless possibilities. So it would be interesting to see that as well. And, you know, it is interesting because this is pre prime directive, right? So there are issues moving forward of, do we share technology? Do we have people share technology with each other? What is our role in sharing technology? Yeah. And it's done so freely here that it does make me wonder. I mean, I wonder if Archer was thinking, gee, we could use this too. I, I thought the same thing. I mean, I don't know if they had the technical capabilities, but I did, I did think about things like that with the transferring of the holodeck information. And now it's time for the sharing of trivia. Abby, what do you have for us about Unexpected? Well, it's an episode about pregnancy, so my trivia is about pregnancy. And Archer says he believes this is the first interspecies pregnancy involving a human. However, later on, there are two other times we see this disproven in Enterprise. It turns out that um, Tucker himself, our trip, has a half Vulcan son in the alternative version of himself in E2, which is interesting. And we also find out when they, the episode North Star, when they see the humans and the Skagarians living together, that there are people who have mated together there as well. However, it is still the first time that we have seen anything canon about a human male becoming pregnant. Interesting. All right. What about you? My trivia is the actor Randy Oglesby, who plays Traval, the Zerillian captain, is the same actor who played Degra in the Zindi arc. Oh, and, j- and that's an actor. Oh, my gosh. Boy, we have some great stuff to talk about in the future. Yeah. And just like Alan, when you hear his voice, you can really hear it. Like, oh, yeah, that's him. So I thought that was kind of cool. Yes. And thank goodness he was wearing heavy prosthetics in this so he could come back because I can't imagine anyone else's digro when we get to that point. And he obviously showed he could handle the Zindi makeup as well. So bravo to him. Absolutely. Transfer of data is complete. And now we've arrived at our Vulcan's verdict. Abby, how do you rate this episode on a scale of one to ten grapplers? Well, I think it's not going to surprise anybody that this one is not going to the top of my list, but I, I, there are still so many good pieces here and there. And the first half is really a cool sci-fi and Star Trek episode. So everything before the pregnancy, thumbs up, everything after, (laughs) meh. And I kind of want to just say, you know what? None of this was as funny as the writers thought it was. So five out of 10 grapplers. Okay. I hear you. I'm thinking along the same lines. The beginning was really cool. Neat stuff. Innovative stuff. That, that I still can't get over that set design was so well done. Decompression process. So well done. Some great stuff here. The costumes. Costumes. The scales. Everything. The scene with Malcolm and Tripp, I really enjoyed in the mess hall. And then, as you mentioned, attempts at humor, not so funny. 
and no. somewhat cringeworthy for me personally. I'm giving it four out of 10 grapplers. And yeah, we're pretty close. Yep. And if you'd like to continue the discussion with us, Abby and I would love to talk about Enterprise and Star Trek with you. We encourage you to send us your Porthos picks, your grappler ratings, and your general thoughts on this episode. But please note, any contributions might be shared on the podcast. You can find us at First Flight Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And Abby, where can they find you? Best place to find me is on Twitter. That's at Abby M. Summer. That's S-O-M-M-E-R. We want to thank you for spending this time with us, and we hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Season 1, Episode 5, Terra Nova. And as always, we leave you with this quote from Captain Jonathan Archer. The most profound discoveries are not necessarily beyond that next star. They're within us, woven into the threads that bind us, all of us, to each other.